Jamestown is in the coastal plains region of Virginia, right along the banks of the James River. I'm David. I'm Alfonso. I'm Brad. And I'm Frank. And, and we're, we're Virginia, Virginia Trekkers. Trekkers. And we're here today in Jamestown, Virginia. Right behind me is a Powhatan village. Third graders, we want you to follow very closely for you can learn your facts. And fourth graders, we're going to talk about some of the hardships of J at Jamestown and why the settlers chose to make a village here. And hopefully we can get down to the river and we can show you the ships that they came in on and some of the other parts of the, the village. Let's, Let's go trekking. Going. We're going to start off by exploring a Powhatan Indian village. Remember, the Powhatans were here before the English settlers. They were part of the Algonquian language group in the eastern part of Virginia, and they were just one tribe in this language group. In the Piedmont region of Virginia lived the Siouan language group, and the Monacan Indians was one tribe in that language group. In the southern and southwestern parts of Virginia was the Iroquoian language group, and the Cherokees were a tribe in that group. Two important Powhatan Indians that you should know were Chief Powhatan, who was in charge of the Powhatan tribe, and his daughter Pocahontas, who helped the settlers survive during their first years here at Jamestown. Here we are inside a Powhatan house. This was called a Yahakin, or you may know it as a long house. They made it out of sticks, and then they had um, swamp reeds for the grass here that they would cut on. And you may notice that there's a fire right here in the middle of the Powhatan house. And it actually wasn't to keep them warm, it was to keep the bugs out. Um, the fire would, was just like a smoking fire and the smoke went out the ceiling up there. So mom and dad would all live here. This was their bed, covered with um, deer pelts. One of the things that you fourth and fifth graders need to know out there is remember that the Powhatan Indians were part of the Algonquian language group here in the Coastal Plain region at Jamestown. Why don't you um, take a look at some of these skins that they, they had. These are some Virginia animals. This is a bobcat, maybe, raccoon, fox, and wolf. Pretty cool. And remember also the, the type of clothing that these Indians wore depended on the season of the year. So if it was the summertime, they would need these skins, or some of these skins to keep warm. But in the wintertime, when it got colder, these skins were very valuable to the Indians. Welcome to a Powhatan kitchen. Obviously, they wouldn't want all the smoke and fire and heat inside one of those longhouses, so they'd come out here, outside, to do all their cooking. You can see they have these different racks here at different heights, depending on what they're cooking and how hot they need the fire to be. Um, but they keep it out here in a nice open spot so nothing would catch fire. Fire was a very dangerous thing in a Powhatan village. Deer was very important to the Indians. They not only used it as covers like you saw in the house, but they also used it for clothing and for other things. But first to use it for clothing, they had to get rid of all this fur. So what they do is they tie it up to one of these posts, take some shells. There were plenty of shells because of the James River. And then they would scrape the fur off, just like that. And it becomes nice and soft. And then they would even soften it further. Um, they would take, this is a deer head. They take his brain the deer brain, and they'd actually use that brain um, to soften up the, the material so it was nice and soft, nice soft leather. That's what we call using your brain. <laughs> well, this is how the Powhatans uh, traveled around, and uh, as you notice, this isn't like the, the boat that you buy at the store now. They would have to take a huge tree, a whole tree, have some coals and some fire inside, let it burn down a little bit, and then we're looking at their tool an oyster shell right from the river here and they'd sit here and have to scrape out all the charred coal or all the charred tree and scoop it out and keep scooping and scooping and scooping and Dave and Alfonso are in a finished boat right behind me or right in front of me. Hey boys and girls here we are in a dugout canoe the way the Powhatan Indians kind of made them and he explained how they made it but what they used them for is they go fishing through the rivers and you know, this area was characterized by lots of rivers. This is one of their modes of transportation, canoes, the Powhatan Indians. The Powhatans lived this way for hundreds of years, but in 1607, three ships arrived from England, and this event would forever change the Powhatan way of life. The three ships were called the Susan Constant, the Godspeed, and the Discovery. They set sail from England in December 1606. It took them almost half a year to cross the Atlantic. They sailed up the James River and landed in Jamestown in May 1607. Let's explore the ships. Hey boys and girls, this is Brad. Um, right now we're on the Susan Constant uh, here at Jamestown and on May 16th, uh, 1607, 104 
men and boys arrived here at Jamestown. Hey, the two boats behind us are the Godspeed and the Discovery. The other two are the fleet that came over with Christopher Newport. We're going to take you a quick tour of this ship to show you that it's not the luxury cruise liners that you're used to seeing nowadays. Hey, boys and girls. We're on the tween deck, which means we are one deck below um, the top of the ship. And as you can see, the conditions in here would be very... Um, different from the conditions you have at your house today. First of all, you can see there's a bed right here, and there's a cannon right next to it. So you can obviously tell that things uh, the ship needed to have cannons to defend itself against pirates, and but you would not want to be sleeping next to a cannon, obviously. So the conditions were tough, and if you notice, the um, the beds are on top of barrels, which would be very uncomfortable sleeping conditions, along with the rough seas coming to the New World. So the settlers had to overcome a lot of different obstacles to make it over here. Alright, we're in Jamestown. Can anybody name the river that's behind me? Did I hear James River? If you said the James River, you're correct. Now if you look out here, you can see the marshy area of the coastal plain behind me, and you'll notice that it, the coast that's right here in front of us, there's a natural harbor so that gave the ships protection when they were docked here in Jamestown. That way the ships wouldn't get beat up in bad weather or anything like that. Up farther up the river, Christopher Newport, after seven days here in Jamestown, decided it was time to keep on exploring. So he took a couple of boats up the James, about 100 miles, and ran into the Fall Line, which we've discussed. And the Fall Line is where the city of Richmond is now and the capital of Virginia. The settlers who were left behind quickly got to work building a fort for protection from the Indians and from the Spanish who had arrived here earlier. Here's how the fort may have looked back in 1607. Next, the settlers had to find a way to start making money for the Virginia Company. Boys and girls, right behind me we have a field of a crop of tobacco. And tobacco was a very important crop. We call it green gold and it was sent to England, their very first shipment in 1613. And once that was shipped, it just started a, revo a revolution of the importance of the tobacco. And boys and girls, do you know who made the first great tobacco crop? It was John Roth. He had some. Um, he had been experimenting with different tobacco crops, and he came up with, with one that was just sweet and great for what they used it for over in England. They loved the Virginia tobacco. One other thing, boys and girls, now that tobacco is growing nice and well in the soil here at Jamestown, the, uh, in 1619 a Dutch man of war ship arrived with 20 Africans, which started an uh, institution of slavery or free labor here in the New World. Inside this fort, you notice that we are surrounded by a huge large fence with sharp points. This, they were very worried that the would be attacked by Indians, so this was to protect them. And inside, you can see where we have some cannons and the holes were carved out or cut out and that's how they protected themselves. They would fire cannons to keep uh, the attacks from coming. And even though they still built the fort, they were attacked several times uh, by the Indians, but at least having this high wall uh, made their um, attacks a little bit less severe. Hey boys and girls, here we are inside the Jamestown fort and this is the kind of houses that they would make. As you can see, they're much different from the Powhatan houses, but they still use the resources around them. Lots of wood, because this is the eastern woodlands, remember? And then lots of dirt also. So the walls were made of dirt, the frame is made of wood. This is something they learned from England, how to build their houses. They use the same principle. Um, they put, um, it's called waddle and daub. Behind this mud is just like, a, they sewed the sticks together, and then they covered up with mud. If you take a look up at the roof, Alfonso with the camera, if you take a look up at the roof, the roof is also a natural resource. There aren't tar shingles like you guys have on your house now. It's actually, it looks like reeds or, or natural fibers found in the environment around Jamestown. But they stack them so thick that the water would just run right off and not get into the building that they're covering. And you may, you may wonder how this house survives in the rain. Because you know, rain washes away mud. Well, it's kind of like, you know in art class when you bake your clay, um, it kind of hardens up. This is kind of like what this is. The sun kind of hardens it up, but it does dissolve over time and they have to recover with mud. But you know there's plenty of mud, so that's really not a problem. Here we are inside a Jamestown colonist house. As you can see, it's kind of small, but it's comfy. Um, all the furniture is made of wood. We usually made it ourselves. We just went in the woods and chopped down some trees. We had an open fire pit here for cooking and for keeping us warm. Um, and as you can imagine, with straw roofs and everything made of wood, fires did happen here in Jamestown Settlement. Um, 
During those long winter days, we had to keep ourselves entertained somehow without TV and things like that. So here's a cool game that we used to play. You figure it out. Come on, let's go in my bedroom here. So here's our t here's a typical Jamestown Connors bedroom. Um, our mattress was usually filled with uh, either straw, hay, feathers, that kind of thing. And um, people were a good deal shorter back in those days. So that's why our bed really doesn't look very, very long. But it was comfy for us because we were kind of short ourselves. Boys and girls, here we are inside of the food storage area. And the foods that they have here, you see if you look up on the top, Dave's going to put it up there, is that tobacco that we were talking about earlier. So they're letting the tobacco dry. And then once they dry it, you notice a bunch of barrels that are here. And they store the tobacco and pack the tobacco down very, very, very tightly. And once the barrel is filled, that's what we have uh, a hog's head. Once the hog's head is complete, now the barrel is ready for shipment. And again, tobacco, big cash crop. Back in those days, they didn't have refrigerators. So this meat, you may think it would get rotten just sitting out here in the open, but they kind of kept it okay by covering up with spices and salt and things like that. So you know Columbus, his big journey was looking for spices, and you may have thought to yourself, why were spices so important? Well, this is exactly why, because it was the way they preserved food. Same thing with drinks. They didn't have all the kind of cool drinks you all have, Kool-Aid, um, Pepsi. They really just had to have drinks that would um, not spoil because they didn't have refrigerators, so like milk spoils. They did find that drinking water was um, not very healthy because the water was brackish because it's kind of a mixture of the Chesapeake Bay salt water and the Jamestown fresh water. I mean, the James River fresh water. So they wouldn't be able to drink the water too much, so they did kind of um, do that. All right, remember uh, the Palatans didn't have any uh, steel tools or metal tools, but once the Europeans came, we started having steel tools. You notice that some of the tools that are found here at the Jamestown Colony are still made out of all natural uh, resources that are found here at Jamestown. So if your rig broke, instead of having to wait for a new one to be shipped over or the blacksmith to make one, you can make one right here out of, uh, out of wood. But you notice that they also had their steel tools. We had real shovels now. We had, um, we had real saws to chop down trees. Powhatans, remember, they were when they were making their dugouts, they had to scrape the boats with shells. Bet you a Powhatan boat would be made a whole lot quicker using these steel tools. And like Frank was saying, once the European settlers came over here, everything wasn't just great uh, for their lifestyles. Many of them died of starvation or disease. Uh, malaria was going around. It was carried by mosquitoes here. So once the settlers started uh, bartering with the Indians, what they would do is um, they would trade some of their steel tools to the Indians um, for some food and things to help them survive. So that's how the steel tools um, have affected both the Palatine Indians and the settlers at the same time. Hey, we're inside the church in the inside the Jamestown Fort and as you notice it's the same type of material that the house was made out of uh, with the mud uh, and the mud and daub or stick and daub and the ceiling is made out of the grasses as well. Uh, let me take a quick little trip around here. Here's the pulpit where the sermons would be uh, read from. And then, uh, if you notice, there's a really fancy chair up here, and that's where the head of the uh, colony would uh, sit during the Mass, and that would be somebody that would represent England, of course. Um, if you lived in Jamestown, you were required to come to church when service was happening. They would go door to door if you didn't show up. If you were sick, you could stay there. But if you were healthy and you had no excuse, you had to be here. If you weren't here, then your punishment would be that you would lose out on your rations for that uh, period of time. And boys and girls, in 1619, this church was the site of the first democratic government in the United States. The House of Burgesses, made up of elected representatives from the different settlements around Jamestown, met here to pass the first laws for Virginia. We hope you enjoyed your tour of Jamestown with the Virginia Trekkers. We're going to end by showing you what some Jamestown armor looked like, and then the highlight of the Jamestown journey is hearing a real matchlock musket get fired. There's my big huge gun. No. Musket. A gun is an artillery piece. That's a matchlock musket. And here's my big huge matchlock musket. Six piece! Yeah! Ha! Six piece! Yeah! Fire! <laughs> Boys and girls, we hope you had a great time visiting Jamestown with us. And we hope you learned a lot. Make sure you check virginiatrekkers.com for new podcasts 
for all information all about Virginia. Keep on trekking with us as we head to the next regions in Virginia. You guys, we got more trekking to do. Ready? Let's go. Let's go. Let's go.